and we are live. Uh, welcome uh, to the Worldwide Neuro Theory or Neuro Forum uh, in a somewhat unusual format from my end today. I'm in my car um, because I have to pick up my daughter from uh, daycare unexpectedly at, at 3.07 uh, sharp. Uh, so I didn't have any other choice than to welcome you uh, from the street. Uh, I have to welcome you all. Uh, at another virtual neuro theory forum today with Mate Lengiel uh, from Cambridge University. Uh, before I introduce Mate, I wanted to say you already know the control features uh, of Crowdcast by now. On the right, you have a chat um, function that you could use at your leisure to express uh, your enthusiasm or ask any simple questions that you may think your audience uh, members uh, will be able to help you with. Uh, if you have more complicated questions, you can uh, post them in the Ask a Questions uh, box in the bottom of your screen. Um, and I will invite you to ask the question yourself uh, if you add the tag on screen to the question. Otherwise, I'll read that question out for you. Um, and uh, hopefully, Mate will be able to answer it at the end of his talk. Now, uh, Mate Lengiel uh, is here today from uh, Hungary, actually. Um, he has a joint affiliation uh, between uh, the University of Cambridge and CMU, is that right? Um, CEU. CEU, sorry. Um, and uh, Mate got his PhD, PhD at Ötvesh, Ötvesh uh, University uh, in Budapest, um, then did a postdoc uh, with Peter Dayan at the Gatsby unit and has been a full professor at the University of Cambridge for some time now. Uh, where he's working uh, on various uh, neuroscientific problems uh, that he aims to solve with uh, the tools of uh, Bayesian interference, uh, amongst others. Um, so without further ado, oh, and I wanted to say, of course, um, it is rather difficult and weird times, not only because of the ongoing lockdown, um, but also, of course, because of the ongoing violence that we have to witness from the side of the police uh, against people of color. And we recognize that especially for um, our colleagues of color, this, these are horrendous uh, things to witness, of course, uh, that goes for anyone else who has a heart um, and, and, and a mind. Um, and I wanted to say that uh, unequivocally, uh, Black Lives Matter, and um, we stand uh, at Worldwide Neuro Theory or at Worldwide Neuro, of course, with our black colleagues um, and hope to contribute uh, to their well being and feeling uh, that they're not alone um, throughout this time. Uh, it's pretty easy to see that we're not doing great on our diversity score. Um, the talks we have been offering have been largely uh, from the global West from the white male and white female uh, complexion. Uh, we're working on making this better, um, especially in these times, I think it's important. But uh, yeah, please let us know if you have any thoughts or questions in that regard or any ideas of how we can be better. Uh, we'd like to hear them. Now, uh, with that being said, uh, a less somber note, hopefully following now, uh, with Mate's talk. Mate, uh, maybe share your screen and welcome to Worldwide Neuro. Just a sec. Uh, can you see my All screen? Right. Yep, perfect. I will Okay, I can't see my screen yet, but I will I will hopefully be able to in a moment or so. Um All right, here we go. Can you see my cursor? Pointer? Yep. Yes. Everything Great. in order. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks very much for inviting me um, in these strange times. Although I have to say the invitation came before the strange times started happening. Uh, so thanks for kind of uh, keeping up uh, the invitation. Uh, and I'm uh, kind of honored to uh, be part of this series, especially now that it's kind of part of the uh, worldwide 
uh, neuro initiative. Um, so today I'm going to talk about something that doesn't need to be as cryptic as the title here shows. Um, it's I'm just using this uh, somewhat cryptic looking title to give you kind of the shortest possible summary of what this talk is going to be about. Uh, but don't worry if you don't know what these acronyms stand for. Hopefully that will become clear uh, during the talk. The human readable version of this title is, is here with actual words. Um, it's going to be about how cortical-like dynamics uh, emerge in recurrent neural circuits that are optimized for a particular computational goal um, that has been in the focus of uh, uh, quite a bit of our research for some time now. to explain each of those key terms uh, as we go on um, in the talk. All right, so obviously one of the big themes and goals of computational neuroscience is explaining cortical responses. Now, what does what explaining means, uh, you know, uh, varies from uh, person to person, depending on whom you ask. But, uh, what I mean here is explaining in in the why sense, uh, so giving functional explanations uh, of, of cortical responses. Why are they organized in the particular way uh, that we see them uh, when we do recordings uh, from the cortex? And so, you know, some of the most classical results about cortical responses, so some of the, if you like, some of the most classical uh, explananda, uh, so things that we would like to explain are, of course, tuning curves that have been around for a good while and uh, earned a couple of Nobel Prizes. Um, you know, these are, for example, the very well-known orientation tuning curves from primary visual cortex, a la Hummel and Wiesel. Um, these are kind of um, the next uh, generation of characterizing neural responses via so-called uh, receptive fields. Again, these are examples from the primary visual cortex primarily because that's going to be uh, what uh, our work uh, is uh, going to address uh, responses in the primary visual cortex v1. So these are um, receptive fields in v1. Um, and it is these kind of phenomena that have been in the focus of a lot of efforts in computational neuroscience over the decades. And when people are trying to ask and answer questions about why we have these particular response properties in, in visual cortex, for example, they've been using a, a variety of different theoretical approaches, you know, efficient coding, uh, as well as uh, some other approaches. But perhaps it's fair to say that in the 21st century, uh, one of the main approaches to answer questions about why has been, uh, the, you know, been borrowing from Kind of contemporary advances in machine learning as well, uh, where uh, we can train neural networks, deep or not so deep, um, to perform particular tasks. So the idea here has been, and this is one uh, particular and very well known by now uh, example, that for example, you can train, in this case, a deep feed for a neural network uh, to perform ob object recognition. Um, and when you train it for that task and for that task only, uh, once it perform, you can first of all establish that it performs at near human level, for example, in this case. And uh, once you have established that, then you can kind of look under the hood and discover that interestingly, um, quite a few properties of the neurons in this, uh, kind of neurons in double quotes in this in these deep networks look like the neurons that we see in the visual cortex. For example, they have similar receptive fields among other things. Um, and so this is a particular powerful way of, of answering why questions, because really you explicitly train for a particular functional objective and then afterwards observe that on way to solving that functional goal, the network develops the kind of properties that we see in the cortex, giving us an idea that maybe those particular properties that we see in the cortex are part of the solution uh, for that particular computational goal. Similarly, um, you know, uh, in uh, in this case, in in higher order cortices such as LIP or FEF, um, you know, decision related activity has been observed um, in this case as a function of time um, activity that looks a lot like evidence accumulation in simple decision tasks or more uh, complex contextual decision decision making tasks. And using a similar logic, people have now trained recurrent neural networks. And of course, this is another body of very influential work uh, by David Susido and colleagues. Uh, they trained recurrent neural networks, uh, again, for solving a task. In this case, the particular 
contextual decision-making task that the real animals in the real experiments had to solve. And we're also going to observe that by some measure, the neurons within these networks behaved si within these artificial neural networks trained for that particular uh, functional goal behave similarly to um, the neurons that uh, you know the experimentalists recorded from during the same task. Again, giving a, uh, give, allowing them to answer questions about why. So that has been a very successful line of research, uh, especially, you know, there has been really an explosion of uh, this kind of uh, approaches in computation and system neuroscience recently. But me, for me personally, um, what I have been interested in is a bunch of aspects of neural activity in cortices, including the visual cortex, that are not often mentioned in this context and are often essentially treated as nuisance. Uh, stuff that is maybe there, but is probably not very functional and something that we don't really want to model, uh, even because uh, you know they, we don't think they are relevant at all. And these include um, uh, a bunch of other kinds of uh, behaviors of, of cortical networks that in contrast to all the kind of behaviors that we saw here, up here, that previous approaches have tried to address, all that was about trial average behavior in the end. Tuning curves, receptive fields, um, even these uh, kind of uh, evidence integration-like activities in LIP are heavily based on trial averages. In contrast to that, there is there has now been a lot of interesting data coming out about the trial-to-trial -trial variability of cortical responses uh, and, and the fact that there is quite a bit of structure in the trial-to-trial -trial variability. So it doesn't really look like just random noise. It is modulated by stimuli, such as, you know, the simplest form of which is that it's, it's modulated by the onset of stimulus, but also other uh, aspects of the stimulus that we'll see later in more detail. There are ongoing oscillations um, in, um, in neural activities in the cortex. Uh, there's also transient responses that are uh, quite different from the steady state response levels of these neurons. So there's all these aspects of, of, of cortical responses that are not often talked about in the context of functional models of, of the cortex. And essentially what this talk is going to be about is to kind of try to bring to bear these kind of approaches um, of answering why questions to answer the question of why do we have these uh, these nuisance looking aspects of neural activity in the cortex. So if you like, we are kind of picking up the pieces here uh, that are left behind um, and trying to make sense of them um, in a coherent uh, and you know, like principled theoretical framework. That's, that's, that's what this talk is, is aiming at. All right, so how are we going to do that? So we need a computational goal. Uh, and the computational goal, very broadly speaking, is going to be perception and within that is going to be the representation of perceptual uncertainty. So what's perceptual uncertainty? Perceptual uncertainty is a term that is used to describe the, mere, the very simple fact that perception is not perfect and it's not veridical, as we all know. Um, we don't see the world out there as it really is and uh, we only uh, see it um, in a way that is uh, subject to noise and ambiguity in the environment. So for example, if I decrease the contrast or the brightness of an image, I become more uncertain about what's out there in the environment around me. Uh, the very fact that we only have two-dimensional projections of, the, of a three-dimensional world in, the, in our eyes means there is quite a bit of uh, ambiguity as to the real three-dimensional structure of the world. Um, there are some stimuli that are uh, that are just fundamentally such that uh, that they allow multiple different interpretations, and of course there is also the fundamental problem of, of that we only ever see a small part of the environment around us. Uh, we only see the, the the world through a through a very limited keyhole, an aperture, uh, which means that we can never be quite sure what's really out there beyond the keyhole through which we are peeking. Uh, out to our environment. So in, in this example, you know, when you see this kind of stimulus, you can't really be sure whether the environment around you looks like this or looks something like this. And these are just, you know, a couple of, you know, highlight examples of why perception is fundamentally um, uh, riddled with uncertainty. And so once you recognize that perception, as by the way, almost any other cognitive uh, faculty is, is, is riddled with uncertainty, um, then the next question is, what's, what's the right way 
of dealing with this uncertainty, uh, especially if you're trying to build a functional model, that's the kind of question you need to answer. What's, what would be the right way, in some way, the optimal way to, to deal with, in this case, perceptual uncertainty? And so the mathematical framework for dealing with uncertainty is, of course, that of probability theory. So in this case, in the context of perception, for example, uh, what uh, we would like to have is what is also known as an ideal observer in cognitive science and, and psychology, um, which essentially um, infers a a so-called posterior probability distribution over the features of the world that are of interest. For example, you know, what, what is exactly the environment around me like? What's, what's out there? Uh, things that I can't know directly, I don't have direct access to, but I, what I do have direct access to is, is the stimulus, of course, you know, whatever is coming through my senses. Um, and so this posterior distribution essentially uh, describes the probability with which the features of the world can be in any one particular combination, given the information that I have directly arriving at my sensors, the stimulus. So that, in principle, uh, can be a very high dimensional and complex mathematical object. And, um, and there is some behavioral evidence, at least, that at least very approximately our brain does represent uncertainty in a probabilistically uh, coherent way, i.e., you know, um, following the basic rules of probability. But the question is how exactly it does it. W what are the neural mechanisms and the neural representations that underlie uh, such and at least an approximate representational uncertainty? And so here, um, what we are going to achieve is that we want to build and optimize neural networks that represent uh, these kind of uh, posterior uh, distributions uh, via their neural activity. And the way we are going to do it is the following. Uh, we will define a, a so-called generative, a probabilistic generative model um, of the world that essentially describes our assumptions or more precisely the brain's assumptions about how the world out there generates uh, images or, or really kind of small pat image patches in this case. And I'll give you more details about how, what, this, what this model exactly looks like. But really at this point, it's a, it's a it's an abstract statistical model um, that uh, describes how some latent causes in the environment interact with each other so that they generate images that eventually reach our, our eyes. Um, and then once you have such a generative model, then you can ask, okay, if I am an ideal observer, observing a particular image or image patch as a stimulus, then how, what kind of inferences would I draw about the underlying latent variables that generated those images? So these latent variables could be objects and features. Again, I'll, I'll give you a concrete example for what I, exactly I mean here. And the basic idea is that the ideal observer, given a particular image, doesn't know exactly what the setting of these latent variables is. And so it will infer a posterior probability distribution over these latent variables. And here, obviously, I'm just showing a cartoon, uh, a two-dimensional uh, posterior distribution over two latent variables given an image. So the ideal observer at this point is really just an abstraction. It's like the homunculus. This is what you would like the brain to compute uh, in principle and represent somehow. But it really doesn't say at this point anything about how this might actually happen in the brain. So what we do next is that we do just that. We say that, okay, let's now you know, become real neuroscientists, as, at least as long as computational neuroscience is, is concerned, and construct an actual neural network composed of excitatory and inhibitory cells um, that receives the same stimulus uh, that the ideal observer uh, is basing its inferences on. Um, and as a result of being stimulated by that particular image or image patch, the neurons in this recurrently coupled EI network will express some activities. And you know, we are going to inject a little bit of noise in, in, into the dynamics. So it's, it's not going to deterministically do something. It's going to do a little kind of stochastic dance in the state space of this network. So here's an example for this. You know, I'm showing, again, this is just a cartoon. Um, I'll be showing kind of real uh, trajectories later on. Um, this, this would be the activities of two excited cells in this network uh, over time plotted against each other. So in this case, essentially this, this uh, spaghetti uh, of, the, of the neural responses traces out 
um, at this, you know, traces out the, the, the neural state space trajectory, which essentially means that different points of state space or different combinations of neural responses will be visited with different frequencies by this neural network, given the same stimulus. And so the idea that we are going to pursue here is that neural networks represent these kind of posterior distributions uh, by essentially having some sort of a correspondence between uh, neurons in the network and latent variables in the ideal of server model. And here we are just going to use the simplest possible such correspondence, which is going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between excitatory neurons here and latent variables here, such that the activity of any one cell in the network at any moment in time um, represents a particular potential value of one of the latent variables so that the distribution of responses in this network represents the distribution of our latent variables uh, that the ideal observer would need to infer in that case. So essentially, what we will require from our neural network, and so that is the functional objective that we are going to train it for, is that the distribution of neural responses um, should match the distribution over latent variables uh, that the ideal of server model would infer for the same uh, stimulus. And of course, this is kind of really becomes a non-trivial task because when we change the stimulus, then both the posterior distribution that the ideal observer infers for that stimulus changes and the responses of the neurons in the network are going to change. But again, we will require a match between these two distributions. Um, and so this is really in the parlance of, of machine learning, this is amortized inference in that you are reusing um, you know, the same parameters essentially, which are the synaptic weights and all the other parameters of this neural network uh, to uh, perform at least approximate inference for a number of different stimuli. And in fact, we, we require the same network to represent just the right distribution, at least approximately for any particular stimulus that might come its way. And so really, in, uh, what, I'm, what I've been describing here is that this neural network represents uncertainty by essentially uh, sampling with its neural activities by sampling uh, from the corresponding posterior distribution of the ideal observer model. So this is what we call a sampling-based uh, probabilistic representation. And it's an idea that has been around for a while. Uh, it really has its, its roots in, in kind of early uh, connectionist uh, literature and uh, perhaps has first been articulated most clearly by uh, these people here, Hoyer and Tivaren and also Lee and Mumford. And since then, uh, through uh, work by uh, ourselves and a bunch of other people, um, it, it has uh, gained some traction. Uh, in, in, in a number of different ways. But this is the basic idea, that neural networks might be representing uncertainty by a sampling uh, from the corresponding posterior distribution. Okay, so now to make this approach work and to make it concrete, we need to define the ingredients here mathematically. We need a, a, a particular ideal observer model that we want our neural network to, uh, uh, to sample from. To, that defines the posterior distribution that the neural network needs to sample from. And we also need kind of a, a neural network architecture uh, to, optimize, to optimize. And in the end, of course, we will need a, a mathematical objective for that optimization. So what are these ingredients? Um, so the first ingredient for the ideal observer model is we are using something that is called a, a Gaussian scale enrichment model, which is originally been developed by um, Aero Simoncelli and um, Udina Schwartz and Ruben Concali and, and uh, colleagues. And essentially, it says that the way images, or at least image patches in the world, are generated is that uh, we have a number of uh, kind of visual atoms or basis functions uh, or basic features, such as little oriented Gabor filters. Um, so we have a fixed dictionary of these. And for each image or image patch that is being generated, um, each uh, we, we kind of mix these. Um, atoms with different intensities. And so the dictionary remains the same throughout our lifetime or throughout a, a long time window. Um, but these coefficients with which they get activated for any particular image patch uh, are different from one image patch to another. So essentially, if an image patch is x, then it can be described as a linear combination of these basis functions with these particular coefficients. So that is, if you're familiar with, for example, the sparse coding model, that, that would be very similar to this, except here uh, there is an additional element, which is that we are going to introduce an additional variable, 
uh, which, which scales essentially the contrast, uh, the overall contrast level of this, uh, of this image patch. Um, and um, so when, when, when it's zero, there is nothing in the image. And when it's, it's, uh, it takes on a high value, then it's a high contrast image. All right, and uh, for good measure, we will, uh, we will allow some noise to happen at the level of pixels. Okay, and so, uh, and obviously for, for it to be a well-defined probabilistic generative model of natural image patches, uh, we need to define some priors over both the Y variables and the Z variables. And the Y variables happen to have a Gaussian prior or a normal prior, and hence it's called a Gaussian scale mixture. And the Z essentially, as you can see, sets the scale of the generated uh, image patches. So hence the name Gaussian scale mixture. All right, so, so far, this has nothing to do with the brain as such uh, on the face of it. This is just a statistical model uh, that might generate uh, image patches. But it has been shown uh, that not only it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's a pretty good first order approximation to the, uh, to the statistics of natural image patches, or at least textures, um, uh, by inverting it to so essentially making the assumption that the brain at least approximately tries to invert this model and infer the values of these Y variables here. Uh, we, uh, one can explain a whole lot of uh, phenomena, both kind of in neural recordings and, and in psychophysics, so behavioral phenomena as well. All right, now importantly, uh, all that previous work was once again uh, based, uh, especially the ones that regard neural activities were based on the average responses of neurons and kind of the average inferences that one can draw about these Y variables. So the posterior mean or the, or the, or the maximum of the posterior distribution. So uh, what we have shown um, following uh, that body of work is that actually if you assume that uh, the brain performs kind of a fuller form of Bayesian inference, that is, it really tries to represent via sampling uh, the full posterior distribution, at least approximately, uh, over these Y variables given a particular image, that explains a number of different phenomena regarding the variability, the kind of the stationary or the steady state variability of neural responses in visual cortex, including the, you know, the matching of spontaneous and, and evoked activity distributions, as well as uh, things like the quenching of uh, variability by stimulus onset in visual cortex, as well as in other cortices. Okay. So in this previous work, essentially what we have done is that we showed that the posterior distribution, uh, the, an, an ideal observer's posterior distribution under the Gaussian scale mixture model um, explains the stationary statistics of response variability in V1. But really that previous work didn't say anything about that, the dynamics of neural responses in V1. So uh, more recently, we have also been looking at the dynamics of V1 responses in a particular class of networks called the Stochastic Stabilized Superlinear Network developed by Ken Miller and colleagues. Um, and essentially it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's based on a pretty standard rate-based description of, uh, of a neural network, an EI neural network. So here, uh, this equation would uh, describe how the membrane potential, the low pass filtered somatic membrane potential of a neuron evolves over time. Um, as a function of its own activity. So this term would uh, describe uh, the leak together with this membrane time constant um, and uh, towards, uh, and with this particular resting uh, membrane potential. But importantly, there are also recurrent interactions in the network of which the strength is given by the synaptic weights, WIJ is the strength of neuron, uh, of the connection that goes from neuron J to neuron I. And the neurons in this network interact through the synaptic weights by their firing rates. Um, and there is also, uh, so these are the finding rates. Rj is the finding rate of presynaptic neuron J, and Hi is the external input that arrives uh, to neuron I um, given the stimulus. And so, uh, an important ingredient of this, is, of course, is to, in order to make this self consistent, is that the finding rates depend on the membrane potentials themselves through a power law nonlinearity of which the exponent is close to two, as we kind of know from experiments by David, by David Furster and colleagues. Okay, so this is this has been previous work and some beautiful work by Yashar Ahmadi and Cam Miller and colleagues that show that uh, networks in this class can uh, can explain um, a number of uh, key properties of uh, visual cortical responses, including divisive normalization, for example. So what we have done in addition to that is, we, is essentially we added noise uh, to these networks and uh, studied 
the way noise is being modulated by the recurrent dynamics of these networks. So the noise that we inject is always the same. It's stimulus independent, but because the neural activities are driven by uh, by the external input, and because these neurons are uh, recurrently connected, this na these these networks will modulate the noise that is injected to them and shape it uh, depending on the particular input uh, that they receive. And so, uh, together with Guillaume um, uh, and and uh, Ken Miller's group, uh, we were able to show that uh, this mechanism uh, can quite n accurately capture a number of properties, uh, a number of aspects in the way. Um, neural variability in the primary visual cortex is, is modulated in a stimulus-dependent manner, um, including the dependence of noise correlations uh, in primary visual cortex as a function of uh, stimulus orientation, for example. All right, so in this previous work, essentially what we have shown is that um, the, with the right parameters, if I set up a neural network and I set the kind of the synaptic weights in just the right way, then it can uh, account for a number of aspects of the dynamics of, of V1 responses. But really, this kind of approach doesn't say anything about the function. It's, it's a purely mechanistic model. So it, it doesn't really answer the question that we set out to answer here, which is the why question. Why do we have these kind of responses? Why do we have these kind of these forms of response variability? So what we are doing here essentially is that we marry these two approaches. And so we want here is a neural network um, with dynamics uh, that is optimized for the function of representing uncertainty via sampling. So that's what we do. And in order to do that, we will optimize the parameters of this neural network. Um, essentially kind of a, a low dimensional description of the connectivity matrix of this network and, the, and a couple of other parameters um, to optimize a, a, an objective that essentially requires it to match uh, the mean of the responses uh, to the mean of the ideal observers posterior, as well as the covariance of the responses to the covariance uh, of the posterior over a number of different stimuli. Uh, so we will have a uh, a set of stimuli in our training set, and we want essentially this, this network to moment match uh, the ideal observer's posterior for each of the stimuli in the training set. And we also require kind of small correlations, although that turns out to be less important. So that's the basic name of the game. We have a neural network with a bunch of tunable parameters, um, and we are going to optimize those, tunable, uh, those parameters of this neural network so that it um, uh, performs sampling-based inference as as, as well as it's possible in the moment matching sense so that it matches the posterior moments of an ideal observer receiving the same input. All right, so um, once we do that, um, and the, I should say that, yeah, th these are essentially the parameters uh, that we optimize in the network. Um, we optimize the input noise covariance, but importantly, that's again, stimulus independent. So any modulation of variability has to happen via the dynamics of the, the, in, the internal dynamics of the network. Uh, the feed forward nonlinearity that connects the stimulus to the, uh, to the actual input that is received by the cells and the recurrent weights that are connecting the neurons. We are optimizing those, or at least some low level parameterization of those, of those things. Um, and every, everything from now on in green will be kind of the, the target uh, set by the ideal observer, and everything in red will be what the neural network actually does. So that's, that's the color code that I will be using throughout here. All right, so when we do that, we optimize a neural network, and after optimization, this is the kind of behavior that we see in here. So, you know, um, we can regard this as kind of virtual uh, calcium imaging or, or voltage imaging uh, uh, more precisely in this network. Uh, here we we see over time what happens in 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 neurons that have different preferred orientations. So essentially, our neurons are arranged along a virtual ring where each neuron is clearly identified by its preferred orientation, which is essentially given by its feed forward receptive field, which we just set by hand to be the same as one of the kind of Gabor filter basis functions of the Gaussian scavenger model that defines our ideal observer. So we don't train those. We only train the recurrent connectivity of the network. So each neuron has its preferred orientation as defined by its feed forward receptive field, which we don't train. And so here we are plotting how the activity of different neurons in the network evolves over time uh, when there is no stimulus out there. So this is spontaneous activity, if you like. And this is evoked activity when we stimulate the network with, a, with, an, uh, with an oriented uh, uh, 
stimulus that has a dominant orientation at zero degrees. And you can see that indeed it's those neurons that have a preferred orientation at zero that become most active, but there's a lot of fluctuations in, in, in network activity here over time that you can see. All right, so does this, do these fluctuations have anything interesting to them? And the answer is yes. So I can plot these fluctuations and again in a different way rather than as a function of time, I can use, use the usual state space plot when I plot the, activity, the activities of two neurons against each other. And what you see here is that in this space, I'm showing again by a green ellipse, the, the posterior distribution that the ideal observer would compute for a particular stimulus. These are five training stimuli that we have. They are really the same image at five different contrast levels. And the red spaghetti shows the actual trajectory of, of the neural network for these, you know, um, for these two neurons at least. And the red ellipse is the covariance ellipse of those uh, neural uh, response trajectories. And what you can see here is that actually this apparently noisy dance of neural activities that happens over time, in each case traces out just about the right kind of uh, posterior covariance that is defined by the ideal observer model. And we can be kind of more systematic and see that, you know, for stimulus uh, at all sorts of different con at, uh, contrast levels, at all sorts of different uh, stimulus orientations, um, the mean activities in the network are reasonably well matched to the posterior mean of the ideal observer, and the uh, and, uh, variability of neural responses is reasonably well matched to the variance or the standard deviation under the ideal observer's posterior, although the match is not perfect, that's also clear. Moreover, even the covariance of neural responses bears at least some qualitative re resemblance to the to the posterior covariance of the uh, of the ideal observer. So really, this network, at least approximately, represents a 50-dimensional. There is 50 latent variables in the ideal observer model, and there is 50 excitatory neurons in the neural network that we are training here. So this neural network really performs sampling-based inference in a 50-dimensional space of of latent variables here for each of these training stimuli, which is you know uh, nice, I guess at least to our, to our eyes. All right, so now this was just for the five training images that we trained the network on. So now, obviously, the next thing we need to look at to establish it, that it's, computation, it's computationally a, a competent network is that it generalizes to stimuli that it has not been trained on. And so first we generalize to new contrast levels, and we see that so the five trained contrast levels are shown by circles here. Um, and you can see that the network kind of interpolates between them in a, in a, in a reasonable way. Again, uh, at least qualitatively matching the, the way the posterior of the ideal observer behaves, both in the mean and the variability. Um, but moreover, we can be a bit more demanding here. We can uh, set the bar higher and also uh, require the net, you know, look at how the network generalizes to completely novel stimuli that sometimes don't look at all uh, anything like what it has been trained on. In particular, note that the that the image that the network has tr been trained on included a single dominant orientation. Uh, but we will, but now we are also testing it with some example images here or some example stimuli um, that have more than one dominant orientation uh, in them. And again, we see a very reasonable match between the uh, ideal observer's posterior green and the network's response uh, red, both in terms of the mean as well as the kind of the principal components of the full uh, posterior covariance or kind of noise re, uh, uh, covariance matrix in the, in, in the network. Um, so this network seems to be quite competently performing uh, sampling-based inference even for stimuli that, that it has not been explicitly trained on and even for stimuli that are quite different from those that it has been trained on. Uh, and this is just two scatter plots that show what the required and, and what the actual response is in the network, again, both in terms of its mean and the covariance of its uh, uh, of its responses, where each dot here is a is a different neuron in a different image, um, and uh, the purple dots are the training images, and the orange dots are the are the test images. All right. Um, so one final note about you know how kind of computational competent this network is. Uh, when you do sampling based inference, um, one critical asset is time, right? Because you need to wait until this network collects enough. Uh, responses, you know, uh, has had enough time to dance around in a large enough part of state space that it uh, at least approximately accurately represents the posterior distribution. So time is of really essence here. And so uh, what we see here is, is, so what we looked at next is is the autocorrelation function uh, 
um, of a representative neuron in, the, in this network. Uh, this is actually the average autocorrelation across all neurons. Um, and what you see here is that these autocorrelations decay surprisingly fast. So the autocorrelate, even though it's a strongly connected network, otherwise it would not be able to modulate its, its variability. Um, and this, you know, uh, strongly connected networks can very easily slow down. Uh, for example, attracted networks do, do that. Um, uh, often, if you have, if they have multiple attractors, you can, you know, they can slow down as you transition from one attractor to another. Uh, that doesn't happen here. This network is essentially as fast as a disconnected network would be. So it's just, it's, it's almost as fast as it possibly can be. Um, and uh, it, this, in particular, becomes interesting in comparison to kind of an off-the-shelf machine learning algorithm for sampling from, uh, from. Uh, from high dimensional posterior distributions uh, in, the, in this way, um, uh, which is also interesting, not only because it's a kind of a standard machine learning algorithm, but also because uh, a number of previous proposals for how neural networks might implement sampling like dynamics essentially were based on this particular machine learning algorithm, which is called the Langevin algorithm. And as you can see, the Langevin sampler is much, much slower than, than our network. So our network in some clever way really discovered a, a very fast way of, of sampling uh, from the right posterior distribution. And one critical aspect of this is that as opposed to the Langevin dynamics, which is essentially by construction, uh, time symmetric, um, our network turns out to be asymmetric in time. Um, uh, so in, in a statistical sense, uh, not in a kind of a biological sense, but in a statistical sense, it doesn't obey detailed balance. Uh, so that the probability of going from one place in state space to another is not the same as the probability of transitioning back. And that turns out to be uh, a key discovery that uh, machine learning, you know, uh, relatively uh, recent machine learning algorithms have also made in order to speed up sampling. But our network kind of discovers it on its own just by the mere fact that we are optimizing it to kind of do fast sampling-based uh, inference. And so dynamically what's interesting is that uh, there is no detailed balance in the dynamics of our network, which is essentially, which therefore essentially has non-equilibrium dynamics. And so we can also make a prediction uh, from this uh, that is to be tested in future experiments about how exactly the lag between uh, between uh, excitatory and inhibitory inputs to the same neuron should be modulated by contrast as well as the orientation of the stimuli. Um, and uh, so that's a prediction that uh, that would be really interesting to test because that comes out quite robustly from our network. And it seems to be a kind of a signature of the network exhibiting uh, non-equilibrium dynamics here. All right, so, so much about computational performance. The key question for us was, okay, so after we have optimized our network for this particular computational goal, fast sampling-based probabilistic inference, what does, it, what does its kind of overall behavior uh, look like? Does it behave at least in, by some measure uh, as a piece of cortex or as a piece of the primary visual cortex. So the first thing, of course, that we wanted to check is that it has, you know, that neurons in the network have reasonable tuning curves and they kind of do, at least qualitatively, and they also show roughly at least, again, qualitatively, the, the right form of uh, variability modulation by the stimulus. And again, here, this is spontaneous activity. Uh, and variability as here is measured by Fano factors to make it comparable to, to experimental data is overall quenched at stimulus onset and the exact amount of quenching depends on, on stimulus contrast. Um, but this, is, this was almost a given uh, because we already knew that if you have a network that somehow manages to sample from the posterior distribution of a Gaussian scale mixture model, it would have these kind of properties. This is something we knew from our prior work. What we did not know is whether on top of showing the steady state response properties, whether it will have any interesting dynamics underlying these uh, steady state responses. And the answer is that yes, it does. So first of all, it shows marked gamma oscillations. So oscillations in the kind of 40 to 80, 40 to, um, yeah, roughly 40 to 80 Hertz uh, band, uh, of which the frequency is modulated by the contrast of the stimulus. So the higher contrast, the higher the gamma oscillation frequency peak, the, or the, the, frequency, the frequency of the gamma peak. Um, it also shows marked transient, transient overshoots at, at stimulus onset. So the black bar here is when the stimulus is presented. This on the left, you always have experimental data. On the right, you have the behavior of the network. And again, there is a qualitative match. There, is a there are strong uh, 
onset transient overshoots, and of which the magnitude again is modulated by, by the contrast of the stimulus. And these transients are inhibition dominated. So that inhibition is, is stronger than excitation if you look at any one particular neuron here. Okay, so that was interesting because these are really not things that we directly trained the network for. Um, we really only constrained its steady state response moment and the fact, and we also trained it to be fast. But other than that, we did not train this network to, in any explicit way, to show these properties. It really just came out that way. So we really wanted to do two things at this point. First of all, we wanted to convince ourselves that you know this is this is not because. This is not just, you know, we've trained an EI network that, of course, you would get oscillations, of course, you would get transients. Um, that it's, it really has to do something with the particular objective, functional objective that, that we trained our network for. Um, and so we trained a network with exactly the same architecture, EI network, exactly the same hyperparameters, exactly the same training protocol as before. With the only difference is that it is not required to modulate its response variability. It's required to modulate the mean of its responses in exactly the same way as our network, but not the variability of responses. And that's important because that's kind of really a signature of sampling-based inference is that it uses the variability of neural responses to represent uncertainty. So we wanted to see what happens if we knock out exactly that element from our objective. So that's what we did next. We knocked out the kind of the second order terms in our uh, objective. And what we saw, first of all, is that yeah, this network still had a very reasonable looking uh, modulation of mean responses, i.e. tuning curves, but it, it did not modulate its variability in any really meaningful way. So the fact that these networks modulate their variability is not a given. You have to really work uh, for them to, to modulate their variability. It's not just because you have a bunch of EI, EI cells connected together. Moreover, this network also did not show any notable oscillations, gamma oscillations in particular, or transients. And again, the only change here is that we knocked out the terms that require this network to modulate its second order moments. And so, um, um, and so um, this really give, gave us confidence and we conducted a number of other controls that I will be happy to talk about at the end of this talk, but we did a, a number of other controls to, to kind of convince ourselves that the results we get, um, we don't get them from random networks, we don't get uh, uh, them from networks that are trained for other kinds of uh, functional objectives, and that we robustly get those properties when we train networks from different random initial conditions on the same objective. Okay, so more on that later if you, uh, if you want to hear in the Q&A session. Okay, so the next thing we wanted to do is that it's great that we get these properties out of this train network, but why do we get them? You know, we, we, want, we really wanted to have a, a deeper mathematical understanding of why we get them. And um, I don't think I have a lot of time to go into the details here, but essentially what we were, uh, what we were uh, able to show um, via um, kind of some more uh, involved mathematical analysis is that, um, is that Oscillations help by improving something that is known in the sampling, kind of in the machine learning sampling literature, is mixing time. So they really help um, uh, neural activities to kind of represent uh, the target distribution with as few number of samples as possible, or within as little a time as possible. And we could show that by essentially um, cooking up. Um, uh, control systems that had exactly the same stationary mean and covariance and exactly the same envelope of the autocorrelation as our network, but did not have oscillations in them, unlike our network. And what we saw them is that the, the divergence of the distribution that they represent um, compared to the target distribution um, fell off much more slowly, you know, the logarithmic scale here, uh, the log log scale really, uh, than the actual, than uh, than a system that had the same kind of oscillatory uh, activities as, as our network. Um, moreover, kind of, it's actually not that difficult to show that overall the mean squared error in representing kind of an average by a samples, uh, by a system that provides samples over time is related to the total area under the autocorrelogram of the network. And so one can essentially understand um, the use of oscillations in such a network as decreasing the overall amount of area under the autocorrelogram. Because these oscillations create lobes in the autocorrelogram that bite out, if you like, area from under the 
autocorrelogram compared to kind of uh, a system that has the same envelope but doesn't have oscillations in, in the autocorrelogram. And this kind of analysis made some further more specific predictions about how oscillation frequency as well as oscillation amplitude should scale uh, with the with the total covariance um, of of the posterior that you are trying to sample from, or the uh, covariance along a, uh, uh, along a particular principal component. Uh, long story short, um, these uh, analytical results explain, for example, why the network shows the why the gamma frequency, for example, is modulated uh, by these uh, by contrast in this network, and and how that is also a signature of using oscillations to speed up inference in this particular way, as well as some other predictions about how um, the uh, how ver how oscillations should be modulated along different directions of neural state space in the network, so that the strongest oscillations should be expressed along directions that also have the most variability in them, even after you normalize for the overall amount of variability. So that's again kind of a prediction to be tested uh, in the future uh, that um, oscillations are preferably expressed in a speed up, uh, you know, in, in a sampling. Uh, in a network that is optimized for fast sampling, the oscillations should be expressed preferentially along directions of greatest response variance. All right. Um, we also did a, um, a somewhat similar analysis of the potential functional role of, of transients in the network. And there, the main insight here is that although transients look like a really crazy idea, uh, when you want to represent the distribution, because you know the activities that you visit during the transient seem really out of the distribution, out of outside the steady state distribution. Here, it turns out that um, by taking a different perspective, i.e., that you really want to do continual inference, you want to represent a, post a target posterior at any moment in time over a sliding time window, that uh, that gives a motivation and just and mathematical justification for the presence of transient overshoots. In particular, one way to think about it is that imagine taking the simplest example is that you want to uh, represent in the mean of your responses a particular target, which will be this green line over time here that changes abruptly from some baseline level to some other level here. So that's the green line here. And now you can compare three different systems, one that changes instantaneously from this baseline to the new target steady state one that decays exponentially towards that, and one that has exactly the same envelope as the exponentially decaying system, but shows this big onset transient here. And you can now take a sliding window over which you average these neural responses and ask within that window, if I average neural responses given by these three different systems, the black, the gray, and the red line, if I average neural responses given by those three systems, how would those averages compare to the target that they should really represent? And as you compute that sliding average, you get something like this. And so now you can see that the system with the transient is essentially as good as a system, as an unrealistic system, I should say, that is able to instantaneously switch from a baseline to the next, and, it, and certainly does much better uh, than the uh, than the system that just decays exponentially, even though these systems have been uh, constructed to have exactly the same autocorrelation. So they have the same mean and variance before, uh, uh, before and after uh, at steady state, um, the stimulus onset. They even have the same autocorrelogram. The only thing that they differ in is this transient, whether they have an overshoot or not, and or whether they change instantaneously or not. And you know you get, essentially get the same result if you compute again this kind of statistical measure of divergence between the target distribution and the and the and the averaged response distribution. And so the 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 key insight here is that when you want to when you want neural responses to express, for example, an average in a sliding time window, you essentially require that their convolution matches a target. So what? So then the question is, what is the response? function of which the convolution looks like a target. Well, you can get that response by deconvolving the target with the particular kernel that you used to convolve in the first place. So essentially, we can understand optimal response transients as the deconvolution of a target signal with the time window, with a relevant time window over which responses might be averaged. And when we do that mathematical analysis and compute optimal transients in closed analytical form, indeed we get transients that look at least qualitatively similar to the kind of transients that our network expressed. And this analysis also makes another interesting prediction, which is that 
the magnitude of the transients should scale directly with the uh, with the steady state um, level that needs to be reached after the after the transients. So the bigger the step that you want to uh, represent, the larger proportionally the transient should be that you express uh, at stimulus onset. So um, that mathematical prediction is indeed borne out in the actual numerical simulations of the network. You can see here that you know how the size of the overshoot scales with the steady state difference uh, in this kind of uh, sampling optimized, uh, fast sampling optimized network. The same uh, scaling has a consequence that not only the steady state responses should have kind of a, a stimulus tuning, but also the, the overshoots, the, over, uh, the transient overshoots should have a, a stimulus tuning. Um, in terms of firing rates, uh, we, we can make very similar predictions in the network. Again, uh, there is a scaling of overshoot with, with steady state differences and the, the overshoot should be larger therefore for the preferred than for the orthogonal stimulus orientation. And now we can compare these predictions with experimental data, with the analysis of experimental data. We didn't do any of the recordings here. We we're just analyzing uh, the data kindly shared by uh, people who have actually made the recordings here. In particular, this is Andreas Tolliances and, and Matthias Bezges groups. And we see, uh, again, uh, quite a strong correlation, which I should say is not dominated by these uh, seeming outliers here. We have checked that quite thoroughly, and I'm happy to give you some backup slides about that if you're interested in the details of that analysis, is not dominated by these seeming outliers here. So really there's quite a strong correlation here between steady state differences and overshoot magnitudes. And indeed we see a tuning of transient overshoots by stimulus orientation in the data as well. So this uh, was to us an interesting prediction of our model that really supports the claim that transients, overshoot transients support continual uh, sampling based inference uh, in our network. All right, so with that, I'm going to summarize quickly. Um, what I have tried to give you here is kind of a unifying theoretical account of three ubiquitously observed feature of uh, cortical dynamics, stimulated, uh, stimulus modulated variability, oscillations and transients. And of course, each of those um, have been given previous theoretical accounts um, in past work, things like uh, uh, binding by synchrony or uh, you know, communication by uh, synchrony or uh, predictive coding for transients and also to some degree uh, uh, for oscillations. But I think it's, it's fair to say that there has been no single computational objective put forward uh, that would explain all of these together in a coherent framework. So that's what we try to do here, to give a, a single unifying uh, explanation for, for all of these phenomena that are most often actually neglected in most uh, approaches that are, for example, trying to train networks for a particular computational objective. Um, if you're interested in how the brain might represent uncertainty, as I am, then this is also an interesting and I, I think quite a rare case of constructing such a network with some bottom-up uh, with some bottom-up constraints built in. So most work on, in this domain has been pretty top-down. You start by a machine learning algorithm and you massage, you know, your dynamical equations until they look like something that real neurons might be implementing at least to some approximation. Here we really start with a uh, with bottom-up constraints built in, so we are guaranteed that we constr uh, that we will uh, respect those constraints that most other neural network models of, of probabilistic inference uh, don't, or, or very often don't. They are low recurrent connections, superlinear FI curves, and so forth. Of course, then uh, the drawback of this is that we had to work hard to make sure that our network actually performs a well-calibrated inference, at least approximately. Which, if you start with a machine learning algorithm, that's a given. Um, so, you know, there is pros and cons for both approaches. Um, and also, if you are interested in functional trained networks uh, of the kind that I introduced on my very first uh, slide, then I guess you can see what we have done as an extension of those approaches when your training objective explicitly includes second order objectives, when you particularly want the variability of neural, net of neural responses to do something interesting for you, whereas previous approaches really only cared about the mean of those responses, not the, not the variability, either because they did not have any variability whatsoever, or, they re or the variability was only there kind of as, maybe as a regularizer, but mostly as a nuisance, but nothing, nothing that would be computationally particularly meaningful here. It's really a meaningful thing. That is what is representing uncertainty, and that's what we train our networks for. Okay, in some potential future directions, um, you know, 
can we do this in a hierarchical system in more interesting and more expressive ideal observer models that can do more than just you know inferring the intensities of different Gabor features? Uh, can we do dynamical inference? The world is changing. This was all based on a very static view of the world. How can we do that in particular uh, when you are when we are already using time to collect samples? How do different kind of uses of time mix on the same uh, single axis of time? Those are all interesting questions uh, th uh, that are probably going to be the uh, focus of some future research. All right, um, I should really thank my collaborators first and foremost, uh, Rodrigo, Guillaume and Lawrence, and I should really say that Rodrigo did pretty much all of the heavy lifting here. So this is really uh, the, the result of his hard work over, over a number of years. So we should really deserve most of the credit for everything that I've told you uh, today. I should very, uh, I would like to very fondly uh, acknowledge people who are uh, kindly sharing their data publicly uh, and allowing us to kind of uh, make use of it uh, in order to test some interesting predictions of our models. Uh, this has been now the third time uh, that we were uh, able to use this kind of data to test predictions of uh, various models that we have been developing over the years. And last but not least, I should also, uh, I would also like to uh, acknowledge very generous funding from uh, these funders, the Wacom Trust, the European Research Council and the Human Frontier Science Pro uh, Programme. And thank you for your attention if you're still out there. It's hard to tell when I'm speaking to my screen, but thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mate. Uh, I've been listening. I've been here, even if I've been a little bit distracted by my kids running around me in circles. But um, we do have some questions, and we have a little bit of time. Um, I'll read them to you. They're not, uh, they didn't request on screen presence, although. Let me invite uh, Dean, who's previously been on the screen, and see if he wants to ask his question himself. Uh, and I'll read, I'll ask you one of my questions in the meantime. Uh, number one is, do you have any observations about the balance of excitation addition in your networks? Uh, clearly, yes. biased question for me. Uh, let me. Let me go back to, to one of the earlier slides that I was uh, uh, showing. Um, so I'm not sure how to do it here. But, um, let me quickly uh, do this. Uh, oh yeah, there are postdoc positions available, by the way. Now that I clicked on it, I should have said this, that if you're interested in this kind of work, come and work with us. Um, okay, can I go back to one of my previous slides? It's not easy in this system. Um, uh, okay. Uh, Memory is pretty slow, but um, there was an earlier slide that I showed. Oh, here it is before it disappears. It, it just did, I guess. Um, but um, here it is. All right. So here, here is the excitatory inhibitor balance, Tim. Um, so as you can see, um, so this is experimental data. This is our network, optimized network. And this is a, you know, our control network. So there's quite a tight balance in excitation and inhibition. So this is the kind of, this is excitatory and inhibitor conductances that we reverse engineer from our primarily rate-based network. So, you know, you should take it with a pinch of salt, right? Because this is really a rate-based network. So we, it's not really a conductance-based network, but we can reverse engineer the, the excitatory and inhibitor conductances that would be required to produce the firing rates that we see in, in our network, right? And so what we see here is that indeed there is quite a bit of balance um, be, before stimulus onset, which gets transiently uh, perturbed by the stimulus. And then things return normal after that. And that is not unlike what people have seen uh, in the data. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's that's the best I can give you in terms of excitatory inhibition. OK, well, that's pretty good, yeah? Um, if you wanted to build this in a spiking system, what would be preventing you? Um, laziness. Um, right. So I don't, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't have a really uh, <laughs> principled answer to that. Um, we, in principle, we should be able to, and perhaps we should uh, build uh, a spiking uh, out of this. But you know, as long as under the usual conditions for a, uh, for rate-based network being a reasonable approximation of a spiking network, um, you know, shown in papers such as let me see, on a can at all Neuron 2014, you might be familiar with that one. Um, you know, where you know people build fundamentally rate-based networks and then show that you know if you construct a spiking network, you know it's it's reasonably well approximated by the by, by the original rate -based. We can we can we could do a similar thing and hope uh, that it would work out in the same way. Um, 
I think the really deep question here is, is what, you know, being slightly more realistic or much more realistic, depending on your taste, is there kind of a functional advantage uh, to kind of adding spikes uh, to these kind of computations? And I think there is some interesting ideas out there, but I don't have a, a strong favorite as yet. Uh, but as long as just let's do the same thing in a spiking network, I think it's probably possible with, with high probability. Um, yeah. Uh, but I think the really interesting question would be, is there anything more that a spiking network could do on top of this? And, and that I don't know yet. I really don't. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, Dean, do you want to ask your question? I just unmuted your microphone. Okay, thanks. Um, I was wondering how important it is for the model that individual neurons capture the latent variables or if they can be captured by principal components or mixtures of neurons. Right, that's a very good question. Um, so the short answer is that we don't know because we haven't tried. Um, so I can only give you a speculative answer. I don't think it matters hugely. Uh, at least n none of our mathematical analysis really requires that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So I would expect these to generalize uh, to the case when you have a kind of a, a more distributed representation of, of latent variables, but we don't know for sure until we try it. I think that's the honest answer. To that. But I think that's Thanks. a good question. Next question. Do you want to introduce Hello. yourself? Um, my name is Zeke. I'm joining from Canada today. It's nice to, yeah, great talk for starters. It was really fun talk. Thanks a lot. Um, so what I was wondering about today is a lot of the work that I've seen um, uh, trying to address encoding uncertainty in populations of neurons has, has been more of distributional code types. And so I was wondering what some of the pros and cons are between using a sampling based on uncertainty, uncertainty code versus a distributional code. And if you think that, or so I'm, I also kind of fit a bonus question here. Um, sorry about this. I was wondering then second, if you think that both types of, of uncertainty representations might be used in the brain, and if so, under which scenarios one might be better than the other or worse? Okay, so I mean, there is a, a couple of different distributional representations and I'm not sure which one you have in mind. Obviously, one prominent example is uh, the probabilistic population coding framework developed by Alex Pouget and colleagues. Uh, there's also kind of uh, the, the thing that is actually called distribution of population codes uh, by Manish Sahani and colleagues more recently, but also kind of back in the time and then revived more recently, I guess. Um, so yeah, there's quite a bit, of, there's quite a few uh, approaches that use more distributional encoding. And I should say just, you know, following up on the previous question is that there is nothing to say that you can't have a more distributional uh, representation in a sampling based representation in the sense that there doesn't need to be really a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, latent variables and neurons in here either, it's just that it's simplest to to kind of illustrate what comes out of this framework in this case. But I don't think, I really don't think that anything fundamentally depends on that particular assumption. And I should say that there have been, um, there have been examples when people explicitly explored, and I should really, I've already said that in response to the previous question, that there have already been examples when people explicitly try to kind of uh, see what would be the consequences of a more distributional, but still sampling based representation of uh, of uncertainty in neural networks. And there I'm particularly referring you to a very interesting paper by Christina Savin and Savin and, uh, and Sophie Deneuve uh, from a couple of years back now, uh, where, they, where they look at just that. Now, so I think it's, it might not, the, the distributional might not be the best way to distinguish those other approaches that I referred to at the beginning of my answer and, and kind of sampling based representations, because in some sense, sampling can also be made more distributional. To, to me, what has always been, and in some sense keeps being the most relevant distinction, is whether you think that uh, neurons live in, you know, in some sense, the space of latent variables or, the, or some parameters, sufficient statistics of the distributions that you're trying to represent. Uh, that is quite a profound uh, distinction to me. Um, and when you are asking about advantages and disadvantages, I think there are at least two different ways in which that question can be understood. Either you're thinking of computational advantages or disadvantages, or you, you might be thinking of biological advantages and disadvantages in terms of how well they account for neural, neural data right, or biological data. Right? So I'm not sure which one you mean, but computationally, um, 
I think you know it's there are obviously pros and cons on either, either side. It's not a coincidence that in machine learning, Monte Carlo based approaches and variational approaches have been kind of coexisting for a good while. And it's really a question of a particular use case uh, uh, that can decide which, which one works best in any particular uh, setting. Uh, where Monte Carlo approaches are obviously very closely related to a something based representation of uncertainty in the neural context and variational approximations uh, uh, would be closely related to what I would call a parametric neural representation of uncertainty of the kind of PPCs and, and distribution of population groups, for example. Now, in terms of accounting for neural data, um, I think uh, the um, there are some things that they can all account for, and there are things that uh, only one or the other can account for. So I should say straight away that, you know, Sampling has really mostly been worked out for relatively, so far, uh, relatively low level uh, kind of sensory cortices such as primary visual cortex as in my talk, right? Uh, whereas, um, for example, PPCs have been already applied to kind of higher level decision making related neural activities as well. Um, so, uh, but I would say that, pro that you know, my subjective view is that, as, at least as, for example, variability in V1 goes, sampling seems to uh, give a more comprehensive uh, uh, account of uh, the phenomena uh, regarding neural variability in V1, for example, than, than PPCs. And I think the rest is to be seen. Um, uh, I should also say that, for example, one big challenge, and that's why I also emphasized it uh, on my last kind of conclusion slide, is that it is yet unclear how to do dynamical inference uh, with sampling-based codes. There are some interesting uh, attempts to do that, for example, by Jean-Pascal Jean Fister and colleagues. Um, but it's there, I think there, is, there really is a fundamental challenge there, because for a parametric, while for a parametric representation, you can represent the posterior at any moment in time. So if that posterior is changing over time, as in, for example, in evidence integration, there's no problem with that in principle. You can, you can, you can change your activities so that they represent that temporal changing target posterior. Whereas in sampling, you even need time to represent a single posterior, a static posterior. So now you would need to use time in two different ways. And that I think is a, still a big open question of how that might be going on. So answering your last question, your bonus question, I guess, uh, it might well be that, uh, that different codes are used to represent uh, uh, uncertainty in, dif uh, in different brain areas or in different uh, contexts, uh, but we really don't know until we have tried to kind of take to the conclusion uh, each representation and see how much they can account for uh, alone. Um, my personal guess would be that as long as you have a, as there is a small number of latent variables that you know you will need to represent uncertainty about under all circumstances, then codes like PPC uh, might be quite useful. Uh, but if you want to represent uh, distribution, uh, distributions over uh, a larger set of uh, latent variables so that you want to be more flexible about, you know, for example, the loss function or the decision uh, making problem that you're trying to solve, then sampling based representations might be, might be better. So I would, if anything, I would expect PPCs to be more relevant for kind of lower level, um, maybe subcortical, uh, uh, less flexible decision making related systems and sampling to be, uh, to be uh, relevant for kind of more flexible cortical uh, based uh, kind of perception and decision making. But at this point, that's really just a wild guess and we really don't know, I think, uh, for sure. Cool. Well, yeah, thanks a lot for, thanks a lot for the answer. Thank you. Um, Alex, do you want to ask your question? I can't hear you, you're muted. Oh, okay, I think now I should be unmuted. Can right, you hear me? Yeah. Cool, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was just wondering, uh, kind of following on Dean's question about this single neuron, one neuron, one variable versus like a dis distributed representation of a latent variable across several neurons. If you had like a distributed representation, could you have potentially an interference problem if you're representing the same variable? Oh, sorry, if, if you're representing two different variables over the same neuron, for example. And if, if, if you would have this problem, would the network deal with that? Um, I don't think there is a fundamental problem with that, or maybe I'm just not understanding your question uh, quite uh, as you mean it. Um, as long as there is a mapping between 
neurons in your network and uh, and uh, and the latent variables in the generative model um, mm -hmm. and and the, and, uh, and as long as that representation is kind of over complete so that, so you have more neurons than latent variables then I think you're fine um, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you're under then yes, I guess you, you could call that interference, which by the way, Tim, is different, different from inference. Um, <laughs> uh, um, then you might, might have a problem with, with interference, but not, not, but not with inference, yeah. Okay, okay, cool, thank you. All right, uh, we have one more question um, by Shervin Safari, so, sorry, I'm butchering that, Safavi. Um, Thank you for presenting this elegant project. I'm curious, the connectivity structure in the optimized network has some specific characteristics, uh, such as sparse or full connectivity, or is there anything else that you can say about the general structure of the network that you observe after training? I have a, a backup slide for that. So if you can just bear with me, let me try to... Um... You have oh, to reshare your screen. Why is that? Did I stop? No, I... I turned it off so that we could have um, people come on, on screen. Can you see it now? Yes, and I'll uh, focus it again, so. All right, so. It's going to be very so how do I do that? Um, uh, I guess there is no no real good way of, of doing this. Let me, maybe I can try. Um, okay. um, they're almost there. Everything. Here we are. That's it. Um, can you see it? Um, so, uh, so the answer to you is that. Um, so I should probably explain that the way we optimize uh, synaptic weights in the network is that we don't optimize each synaptic weight individually. Um, which I know is a joke if you are coming from a kind of a function optimized neural network background where you routinely optimize thousands, if not millions of parameters. In total, we optimize 16 parameters here for reasons that I'm happy to talk about uh, maybe another time because I guess we're running out of time now. Uh, but so we really needed a very low dimensional parameterization of our model. Uh, so the way we, for example, parameterize uh, synaptic weights in the network is that uh, we had these four quadrants, if you like, of the of the synaptic uh, of the recurrent weight matrix E to E, I to I, I to E, E to I, and each of these quadrants, uh, connections in, in each of these quadrants were uh, uh, parameterized to be uh, shift invariant um, and uh, and have essentially a circular Gaussian profile. So, in other words, the connection strength between any two neurons depended only on the difference between their preferred orientations. Um, and this dependence was parameterized as a circular Gaussian function. And so all what we learned for each of these quad quadrants were, was the amplitude and the width of that uh, circular Gaussian. So that's why in total we have eight parameters for the recurrent weights. <laughs> and so uh, what we find here is that um, the, interestingly, the um, the the tuning profile for uh, connections that are of the same design. So excitatory connections had almost the same tuning profile, independent of what kind of neurons they they went to. Either they went to excitatory or inhibitory neurons. And similarly, inhibitory connections had the same profile across the network, uh, independent of whether they were going to inhibitory or excitatory neurons. If we normalize by, the recurrent, by these recurrent weights by their uh, maximal value at the zero orientation, preferred orientation difference, so on the x-axis is the di is the difference in the preferred orientation of the two neurons of which we are looking at the connections. Sorry about that. Um, then what you see here is that inhibitory connections are slightly, actually slightly more narrowly tuned than excitatory connections, 
But if you actually look at the tuning of excitatory inputs, as in conductances uh, during network activity, um, uh, then it turns out that excitatory connections are a little more narrowly tuned than than in, in, than than, in, than inhibitory conductances. So the connections, kind of the anatomical connections, so to speak, in the network, uh, are have a similar tuning width with inhibitory. Uh, weights somewhat narrow, more than narrowly tuned than excited ones, but if you look at the actual conductances, that relationship reverses. Um, so I don't know if you want to call it sparse connectivity. Um, I don't think it's particularly sparse connectivity, but that's partly because of the uh, kind of disappointing fact that we didn't uh, optimize uh, connections individually. And also we think of our units uh, in the in the network, not really as absolutely individual neurons, but like uh, probably standing for uh, a couple of neurons together. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But, and so obviously one of the things that we would like to do in future work is to kind of scale up our optimization approach, which is a number of challenges that, you know, in uh, more traditional approaches, people don't need to deal with, uh, uh, but we do. And that's why we had to be very conservative here in the number of parameters. We